Welcome to the You Got Into Wear podcast. I'm your host, Joy Wade, author, college admissions coach, and founder of You Got Into Wear. Every Monday, I bring you actionable interviews with college admissions experts and students who share their insight on college applications, essays, scholarships, financial aid, test prep, and more to help you get admitted into your top choice universities. Let's get started. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the You Got Into Wear podcast. I am so excited that you are listening to today's episode. If you're a high school student who wants to learn the ins and outs of the college admissions process and eliminate the stress of learning everything on your own, you have to consider getting your free college admissions glossary guide from You Got Into Wear. The College Admissions Glossary is a downloadable PDF that provides over 50 college admissions and financial aid related terms and definitions for students. The college application process is overwhelming and the glossary will eliminate hours of research and confusion while filling out applications for admission, scholarships, and financial aid. You can download the free guide at glossary.yougotintoware.com. That's glossary.yougotintoware.com. Let's get straight into today's episode. Today, I am delighted to welcome our guest, Megan Dorsey from College Prep Results. On today's episode, we discuss the PSAT and National Merit Scholarship Contest, whether students should take the SAT or ACT or both, the main differences between the SAT and ACT, and the sections on each exam, whether or not students should take the tests with writing, and how to determine what test scores you need for your college applications. Megan Dorsey believes every student and parent should be equipped with the knowledge and tools to make the college admissions process less stressful and more successful. From test taking and grades to picking the right college, Megan has helped thousands of students prepare for the SAT and ACT and gain admission to the colleges of their dreams. Megan understands the field of college admissions from a variety of angles. There goes those, there goes those horns I was talking about. (laughs) Megan understands the field of college admissions from a variety of angles. The parent of a rising senior, former high school counselor, and graduate of Rice University, Megan brings personal and professional expertise to the unique challenges each family encounters. Megan has over 20 years experience in the field and is co-host of the College Prep Cop podcast, where the goal is better grades with less stress on the path to the perfect college. Thank you so much for being on the show and welcome, Megan. Thank you for having me. So I wanted to just give you the chance to explain what you do in your own words to our audience. Essentially, I help students and families with the test prep necessary, that's usually the SAT or ACT, and the work necessary to put together a college application that will both get a student into college, but hopefully also get merit aid. Awesome. I know a lot of students who are listening are looking for that help. So I wanted to take the time to take today to really discuss the SAT and the ACT for students who really have not taken it before, have no idea where to begin. So would you be able to kind of walk me through a four-year overview, freshman to senior year, of what students should be thinking about, what tests they should be taking, and when? Absolutely. Students, even as early as junior high school, should start on the important step of actually learn the material in school. You don't need to put your sixth or seventh or eighth or even ninth grader into a test prep course. He or she needs to learn the grammar taught in English class, learn and retain the skills in math, and start to develop reading comprehension skills with a vocabulary appropriate for their grade level. So that's the first step that all students should work on, really no matter what their age. Um, But that's, that's the beginning part. Usually in ninth or 10th grade, students are then presented with some experimental options to find out how they're doing. And that usually comes as the PSAT or the plan test, which is similar to a pre-ACT. And of course, whether a student 
It takes these in ninth grade or 10th grade, may depend on the school they attend. I'm in the Houston, Texas area, and my daughter, who's going into her senior year, started taking the PSAT in ninth grade. Her school and district, in fact, most of the schools in our area have decided to start administering those on the Wednesday administration for the PSAT and get the entire school involved. So in our example, she took the PSAT 8-9 in ninth grade. It's designed for eighth and ninth graders. And that gave us a beginning glimpse of how she was expected to do on that particular test, in this case, the, the SAT or PSAT. So that's sort of the beginning part. I start working with students typically as juniors. And so it's really nice if a family can come to me with a sophomore and say, here are our PSAT results. What do we need to do? Where do we need to go? Here are our plan results from the ACT. Where do you advise we go? And the real preparation then starts as a junior because most students are going to be taking the SAT and or the ACT junior year. So that's the that's the starting point, but then there's so many other questions and details that come up as we go along, and I'm sure you probably want to discuss those with me. Of course. So let's backtrack to the first time a student's going to encounter these tests. You mentioned the PSAT and the plan. So I know a lot of students hear about these tests, and they kind of think of them as just a practice for the those tests. And of course, it's a practice, but how important is the PSAT, for example, and should it be something that students are studying for? The PSAT in ninth or 10th grade is purely practice. It's a diagnostic test, if you would, tells you how you're expected to do. Doesn't count for anything, but I always tell students, take it seriously. Don't go in that day and goof off and waste the opportunity But also, you don't need to do a lot of prep, and you don't need to stress out about it. Just go do your best. Junior year, however, the PSAT, this does not apply to the plan test. It is just the PSAT, also counts for National Merit Scholarships. So you may see when that booklet comes home from the guidance counseling office at school, it says PSAT slash NMSQT, that means National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test. But that's only for juniors, third year students in the high school. When they take the PSAT, that's the entrance test, the qualifying test for the National Merit Competition. So in that case, for those uber high scoring students, that test is super important. For everybody else, for your average test taker, for your struggling test taker, the PSAT is still a practice. But for your super high scoring students, the PSAT junior year only can mean big money. Right. And I know that the chances of earning that scholarship are a little bit slim. So for students who are listening, if you don't qualify, don't be alarmed. That is just one of the many opportunities that you will have to earn a scholarship in this long process of applying to college. Absolutely. I I was going to say, you know, when we're looking at who qualifies for national merit money, it is a small sliver of students and it is not even, you know, representative of the majority of students who are going to earn academic scholarships to college. It is just those elite test takers. So Megan, after a student is done taking their PSATs, they have their scores back and it's time for them to take the SAT or the ACT. How do you suggest they navigate taking one or both tests? How do they choose what what it's what they're going to take? It's a little bit more complicated than that. And the first thing I would start off by saying is don't wait until you get your PSAT or plan scores back. If these days you're waiting until you get those scores, maybe December of your junior year, you might have already missed the best opportunity for you to take either the SAT or ACT. 
because the best time to take those tests is the time junior year when the student has the best opportunity to prepare and focus. And for some students, either their motivation is higher in the fall, but more likely they have more free time. I'm thinking specifically of the baseball players that I work with, who their best time to take the SAT or ACT is in the fall. And if they wait until they get their PSAT scores back, they're heading into their active sports season where they don't really have as much free time and may have conflicts either with practice or with games or tournaments that prevent them from taking the test. So I want to encourage all families to look and say, heading into junior year, when is the student going to have the most time and motivation to prepare? So that's the first question. The second question is what you were getting at, Joy, which is, what do we do? Should we take the SAT or should we take the ACT? That's the loaded question when it comes to test prep. And I can't say that there's a clear cut answer. But here are the things that I suggest for my clients. First, if you have a PSAT or plan score, go ahead and use those and make a comparison. Which one is higher? Which test does the student prefer? Because sometimes students have pretty similar scores on both tests and they just like the format of one better. That could be what makes the decision for you. If you don't have maybe plan scores, like in the case of my daughter, her school just doesn't offer that test, you can get a free, official, full-length practice test from both ACT on their website, act.org, or SAT, and that's going to be the collegeboard.org website. Get those practice tests. Print them out. These are paper and pencil tests. Don't try and take it on your computer or tablet screen and take it like a real test. Maybe sit down with friends one Saturday morning, you know, everybody around the table and time it like a real test and then compare those scores. I never suggest signing up and taking the actual test, quote, just for practice or just to see because now you're putting an official score on record and that has some potential downsides. So I really encourage everybody to look at either a practice test you took at home or the PSAT and plan to determine which test is right for them. Perfect, yeah, I definitely agree with taking one of each, a practice test where there's low stakes. Don't just go into both tests and pay for them, not knowing which one you think, you know, are you're more comfortable with and you're going to to better to do better on. So definitely go grab those free tests and see which ones you feel more comfortable with. So another thing that can help students decide is to kind of just understand the differences between the exams. Because I remember when I went into my college admissions process, I knew about the SAT, but I didn't really know much about the ACT. So could you kind of just take the time to break down the sections on each exam and what they're actually testing? Absolutely. Um, Keep in mind that the SAT changed back in the spring of 2016. So people who are listening who may remember when they were uh, preparing for college or maybe even sending an older sibling to school need to recognize that that's a recent change. Right now, the SAT has two scores that a student receives. One is reading and writing. They give it the long and weighty name of evidence-based reading and writing. And it basically is 50% reading passages. Students read the passages. They answer questions about the details. Some of them relate to vocabulary. Some of them relate to thinking and finding information, making connections, proving it with evidence. Most students are familiar with that type of passage-based reading. The writing is really multiple choice grammar. And where it used to have different types of grammar questions, now with the reformatted test, SAT grammar looks almost like an identical copy 
from ACT English. So those two parts are almost the same. The second score a student's going to receive on the SAT is math. Here's where I want to point out a couple of differences. The new SAT math goes pretty deep into what I would consider Algebra 2 concepts. So students who might be starting Algebra 2 their junior year may find that they are not prepared with the skills and knowledge needed to take the SAT until well into spring semester. That could be a downside or a reason not to take the SAT. There's also one section of the test, probably about 40%, where students are not allowed to use calculators. Now, quite honestly, some of these are questions you wouldn't have used calculators on anyway, but I find with a lot of my clients, there's a psychological effect. Ever since they started in algebra, students have been taught, hey, use your calculator, use your calculator for computation. All of a sudden, that's taken away from them. And it's a goodness, what should I do type of feeling. And even I find I get a little rusty doing the old paper and pencil math. So those are, those are some things to consider for SAT math. Now let's talk about the ACT. The ACT has four sections where students are going to receive scores. It's English, reading, math, and science. English, like I said, is almost identical to SAT writing. It's multiple choice grammar. The second section is math, all multiple choice. Now, there are a couple questions on the SAT where students have to produce their own answers and bubble it into a grid. On the ACT, it's all multiple choice. There's not as much heavy algebra too. So I find that the algebra students need to know is usually something they've covered in taking Algebra 1. In some ways, I think that the ACT math is a little bit more straightforward than the SAT math, but I can't say that either of them are easy. You know, they're, they're just a little bit different. ACT reading, again, like the SAT, you get a passage, you answer questions. I think the reading itself is a little easier on the ACT. The downside is you have less time per question. So it's sort of like pros and cons to each. This is why it's valuable to take both to see which one. The fourth section of the ACT, I think, is the most misunderstood, and that's science. If I were in charge, next time I'm in charge, I'm calling this reading with charts and graphs. It really is not knowledge <laughs> of science. It isn't. Anyone who looks at it and you think, oh, well, this wasn't what I was expecting. And that's why it can be a challenge for students. Picture you're given what they call a passage, but it's a setup of information with different charts and graphs and the questions ask about them. I haven't taken a science class in over 20 years, and that doesn't hurt me on this part of the test because I don't need knowledge of biology, chemistry, physics, earth science, etc., I just need to be able to interpret data. Now, when the SAT reformulated itself a couple years ago, they started including more charts and graphs. And that's why you'll find some charts and graphs in things like reading and writing. They may seem out of place, but part of that is a keeping up with the Joneses. The SAT wanted to have something comparable to what the ACT was testing. So they're pluses and minuses to each test, a little bit of everything, and a fair amount of overlap. You know, math is math up to a certain point. Right. And I know that both tests have a writing section. Students ask me all the time, should I take the test with writing? And if they're retaking the test, they say, should I take it with writing again? What is your opinion on that? So when, when you say writing, that's the written essay, and everybody seems yes, yes. to call it something different these days. But just to clarify, that's not the writing portion of, of the SAT. I tell students right now, fewer and fewer schools are requiring it, but there are still a few schools or scholarship programs that require students to have that written essay from either the SAT or ACT. So if you are a junior going to take the test and you aren't 100% sure of every single program to which you will apply, 
take the written essay. My daughter took these tests last year, and every single time I said, take the essay. It's an added, you know, 40 or 50 minutes onto your testing day. It's at the end, and it does not impact your multiple choice score. It'd be a real shame to go get a great new multiple choice score and have a school say, well, we're not going to accept that because we require you to have the written essay. Now, seniors, I tell them, hey, if you know all your schools, take the time to do the research. I, in fact, met with a new client yesterday. I asked her, do you know if you're required to have the essays? And she kind of looked at me puzzled. And I said, look, you either sign up and take the written essay, but it may take you longer to research all the schools on your list to determine whether or not you can skip it. So safe side, go ahead and take it. Definitely. That's what I always suggest. You never know if you're going to want to apply to a school last minute and you don't want the reason you can't apply to be that you didn't take the writings, what? the writing and essay portion. One of the funny and surprising uses that I've seen for this comes from LSU, Louisiana State University, which doesn't require writing for admission. But for years, in order to get into their honors program, they equally weighed a student's GPA, their standardized test score, and their written essay. They valued so highly that written essay coming off the SAT or ACT because it gave them a true glimpse into that student's communication abilities. So I always use that as an example of you may not think about it when you're making those initial applications. It's good to have it in case. For sure. And for the SAT and ACT, are there benchmark test scores for each exam? Or how can a student kind of figure out what score they need for their applications? It's always the question, is my score good enough? You can look at your percentile ranking. In other words, if we lined up 100 people, how many people are you ahead of in line? If I'm at the 95th percentile, I'm ahead of 95 other people in that line score-wise. I tell students, think of that kind of like a class rank. Class ranking is really big in Texas. And we look at, am I in the top 5%? Am I in the top 10%? Am I in the top quarter? You could do the same thing with your percentiles from the SAT or ACT. That's part of the information you get back with your score. But maybe more accurately, students need to look at the scores at the schools they're interested in. So I might say I have a 650 in reading, writing, and a 650 in math on my SAT that would give me added together a 1300, which puts me above the national average. And that may put me above the averages at some schools, but it may put me within average at other schools or below average at others. And so when Families are looking up numbers. There's so many places they could go, but colleges generally report the middle half. So when you see that range of scores, it means 50% of the people who got in had between, you know, whatever the number is, 590 and a 680. So my 650 would be in that middle. It doesn't guarantee that I'm going to get in, but it kind of gives me the idea, hey, I'm within normal for this particular school. If I'm below, then I look at that and say, well, you know, say I'm applying to my alma mater, Rice University, where the averages are higher. Just because I have a 650 in math doesn't mean I won't get in, but I can also look at that and say, you know what, 75% of the students applying and getting into Rice have scores higher than mine. It gives me an idea of the likelihood, tells me, well, maybe I need to study some more. And that's the way that I would tell people to use those numbers for comparison and goal setting. Definitely. You can always use Google, go to your school's website and look up that freshman profile, which is where you can find the test scores of the students who are admitted the previous year before you applied. So after students have an idea of which tests they're taking, the scores they need, how do they even start to study for these exams, what do you suggest students do first? Uh, Once you've decided which test you're going to take and which test date. 
set a goal. Let's say I'm going to take the December ACT. I would generally suggest students allow themselves somewhere between six and 10 weeks to study. And some students are going to be able to study and practice on their own. Others are going to want a little bit more guidance. And that's where I would encourage them to find a high quality prep class or tutor in their area. And the number one thing, whether you're doing it DIY or whether you're working with a tutor or a prep class, use official materials. Both College Board and ACT publish books with practice tests. So there's a big blue book from SAT, which has the eight practice tests, same ones they have on the College Board website. That's the best way to study. ACT has just this summer come out with a new edition of their big red book, which unfortunately only has four practice tests, but that's the best place to get started. There are other idea books that you could find at the bookstore that offer strategies, but all of those books have their own version of the questions. And with something where questions come down to precise wording, you don't want something that's close. I would describe all of those others as like the knockoff handbags of the testing industry. From a distance, it might look like an SAT or ACT question to the person who doesn't know what they're looking for. But the more you get to know it and the closer you examine it, those questions really aren't helpful to you. Exactly. And I will have those books that Megan mentioned in the show notes for you guys to check out if you are interested. So practice tests, are there any strategies you have even beyond doing practice tests? Or do you think that is the number one way to prepare? You can't just take tests. The The number one thing you need to do is take the test and see what you're missing and find out how to best supplement it. And that's where some students can do that on their own. Oh, I missed this question in math. I can figure out why I can teach myself the things I need to know so that I can pick up on it next time when I see a similar question. Now, a lot of students find that that's really overwhelming or they find that they have such big gaps in their knowledge that they really can't teach themselves the grammar that they need or math strategies or how to improve on reading. And that's where someone like me comes in. And I would say that there are so many strategies. But one of the things, big picture that I would tell everybody is the learning you do in school is about learning and doing things right. When it comes to the SAT and ACT, this is not measuring your learning. These are like giant games. And if you think about it that way, The SAT doesn't care whether you show your work in math. The ACT doesn't care whether you did it, quote, the right way. They care whether you bubble in the right answer. So throughout the entire test, use strategies that help you get the right answer faster and with less effort. And so shortcuts and other strategies are really helpful. Awesome. And for students who have an idea in their head that they don't have to study for these tests, um, do you think that what they learn in school is enough to perform well in these exams? Some people are naturally born test takers, much like some people are born with a natural musical talent or an athletic talent, but that doesn't mean that they couldn't get better with practice. You know, we we didn't see Michael Phelps go to the Olympics on no practice and win. You can have a natural test-taking ability and still need to fine-tune it. So I would say take a practice test. And if slam dunk every time you're getting a perfect score, show up with no further practice or no further study. But most students, especially really high-scoring students, are probably going to be bothered by missing even a few questions. And that's where even a little bit of study can come in handy. For some students, really high-scoring students especially, just taking a couple extra practice tests gives them that familiarity that they say, oh, I remember seeing something like this before I know what to do. But I'm not a fan of showing up and taking it cold. 
Me either. I definitely think you should get your eyes on some questions just so you can get familiar with the test. You do not want to go in blindsided. I wanted to ask a question for parents who might be helping their students or older siblings who took the old SAT. So do you think that these exams are beyond the stereotype of just doing vocab flashcards and things like that? Oh, it hurts my heart. I had to give up making kids do flashcards. (laughs) Um, For the longest time, really, you know, for 20 years, I would give kids a list of high frequency vocab words and I'd make them put them on flashcards because it used to be that 50% of your reading score on the SAT was based on knowledge of vocabulary. And if I could get kids to know more words, I could get them to score higher. But it's no longer really worth their time. There is vocabulary. Don't think that you've been let off the hook. They've just embedded it so deeply into the passages and the questions and the answer choices on both the reading and the writing portion of the test that it's no longer one of those slam dunk, you learn the words, you score higher. You do need to know the words. It will help. But for me, it's really no longer worth it to make my clients do that as part of their prep. That's where learning what you should have learned in school the first time is the best preparation. Because we know most people are learning vocabulary in English class and as they read. But unfortunately, it's not quite like the old test. Right. Do you have any free resources that you think students can begin with? What is your opinion on um, online schools like Khan Academy for preparing? It's funny that you ask that because right before we got on to record this podcast, I was making a homework list for one of my clients who, in fact, is going to be taking the ACT for him to go through the Khan Academy review for the SAT because I like the review for math and grammar. I find the math and grammar review is good for all students, whether they're taking the SAT or the ACT. It's a good thing for 10th graders to do in many cases as they're getting ready. They're finishing out their sophomore year. They're starting to think about preparing for the test. I think those are excellent resources. And one of the things that makes it such a good resource is Khan Academy is using official questions from the College Board. So going back to what we talked about, official versus the knockoff handbag questions, the Khan Academy questions are official SAT material. And I think that's a great way to get started. Perfect. I wasn't quite 100% about Khan Academy being official questions, but I'm so glad to hear that because Khan Academy is awesome. It is, Um, and it's free. Now, here's the downside. I don't find their reading or their essay material to be very useful. But the math review and the grammar review, that's good stuff. Noted. So studying is finished and it's time for test day. What types of advice do you give your students who might be a little bit nervous about going into the test? What do you want them to make sure they're doing on test day? Hopefully, they've practiced enough that they've developed some level of comfort. And there's no amount of practice that's going to take a nervous test taker and make them a naturally happy and excited and enthusiastic test taker. But it's about managing that anxiety and saying, you know what, I've prepared and I've done good enough. And it really helps to keep in the back of your mind, I can take this test again if I need to. This is not a one-time only deal. Get good sleep the night before. Get up early. Get yourself energized. I have so many students who struggle on the SAT and ACT because they're not awake at 8 a.m. And I had one student a couple years ago did something that I thought was so brilliant that I've been telling all my clients about this. He said, you know what? I just wasn't quite awake. The first time I went to take the ACT, he said, so this time I got up and I just went for a run, came home, took a quick shower. And by the time I got to the test, I was really awake and mentally alert. 
And I've been making that suggestion to a lot of students. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to go for a 10 mile run. You know, I'm sure his mile was faster than mine would be. But hey, go out for a quick workout. Make sure that you're ready and alert. And that's the best way, if you've been doing the preparation, to show up and apply what you already have learned on the test day. Awesome. I remember those early mornings. It is hard. So make sure that you are awake, you eat breakfast, and you get all of those pre-test jitters out of you. You've prepared and you're going to perform great, everyone. So after um, a student gets their test scores back, how many times should they retake the test? Um, How do they know when it's time to stop retaking the test? (laughs) Most students nationwide are going to take their test of choice two, maybe three times. Um, That means on average, there are some people who are taking it more. But I also have some clients who take it one time and they hit their goal and they're done. I encourage families, because it's not just the student and it's not necessarily just mom and dad, to come to an agreement ahead of time on what number is good enough. At what number can we declare victory and call it quits? So set that goal based a little bit on your own experience. This is how I've been doing. I think that if I hit this number, it's my personal maximum. It's probably not a perfect score. For for many students, it may just be, you know what, I cannot wait if I can get a 24 on the ACT. If the average score is 20 and the highest score is a 36, a 24 is just a bit above average. But for some students, man, that would be the best they could hope for. Also, like we talked about before, Joy, inform yourself about the numbers you might be expected to have for the schools on your list. And those two things combined, your personal ability and your school list and their numbers they require should help you decide, am I going to retake it or can I call it quits? And after a student retakes the test and they're finished testing, should they send all of their scores to their schools um, for both SAT and ACT or should they pick and choose which scores they're sending? Oh, that depends. And it depends on a few things. If you have a choice, send your best scores. And that may mean that you're sending just your SAT scores or just your ACT scores. But you need to know the difference. And if you don't know the difference, you need to get someone's advice. Years ago, I worked as a high school counselor And I had a student come into my office just about in tears in the spring. She hadn't gotten into one of her top choice schools. And I said, why why didn't you get in? I'm I'm sure your numbers had you qualified for, for automatic admission. And she said, yes, this is what I had on my SAT and my ACT. I said, well, goodness, we're going to get this admissions guy on the phone. And I called our representative for that particular university. And he said, you know what? She never sent us her ACT scores. Her ACT scores would have qualified her for admission, but she didn't send them. And it's after the deadline. We are not going to accept them. And so she learned that lesson the hard way that she she needed to send them. And it, it was maybe an oversight on her part or her family's part. And there can be dire consequences from that. There are some colleges and universities that has that have a policy asking students to send all of their scores. If you're applying to one of those schools, send them all. But if not, you can choose. And I know a lot of times students are very worried. They're almost self-conscious. Well, I don't want them to see this particular one. Every college and university rep that I've ever talked to said, we really use the best scores. We're looking for a reason to admit We're not looking for negatives, so don't worry about it. But I know it does put some families at ease to know, hey, we don't have to send that particular score. And as long as it's not the policy of the university to which you're applying, you get to choose. Awesome. I remember I 
Me personally, I took the SAT and ACT one time during my junior year. I performed way better on the ACT, which is the case for a lot of students. And then I retook the ACT three times (laughs) for me to get my goal score and It was really a matter of I knew what score that I wanted. It was feasible, and I ended up getting that score, and I sent in those scores to the schools I was applying to because some schools had requirements. In order to get a scholarship, you had to have a certain test score. So I already knew if I get this test score, I'm going to get a scholarship at these schools. And some schools, even after you're admitted, will allow you to keep taking the SAT or ACT to up your scholarship dollar. You know, here in Texas, Baylor University says up until the day you walk in for the first day of class, you can retake your SAT or ACT and we will award you more scholarship money if you make it to the higher level. So that's the reason occasionally I will work with second semester seniors in a test prep scenario because they're trying to get those extra points. Just like you had in mind, this is what I want to make. They say, you know what, it's worth my effort to do this studying. You know, even $2,000 more a year in scholarships, hey, for $8,000, could you sit down and crack open the book and study? Of course you could. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. So make sure you are looking at this fine print. See if there are any scholarships or opportunities that will open up for you due to test scores. I wanted to give you the chance to talk more about how you and your company work with students and give the rundown. Sure. I offer prep classes in my local area. I'm in Sugar Land, which is a suburb of Houston, but I know that that might not be appropriate for all your listeners. So I do a lot of private tutoring online. Uh, via Skype or Zoom. The technology we have these days makes it wonderful. I've worked with, you know, students as close as Texas, you know, and as far away as, you know, Hong Kong. So there are opportunities, whether you're local, somewhere in the U.S. or even international, that we can set up one-on-one tutoring. I also offer some programs to help walk families through planning for college. You know, what do colleges want? How do I find the right schools? What courses should I be taking in high school in order to set myself up for success in the college admissions process? And I have those online at my website, collegeprepresults.com. Awesome. And would you like to talk a little bit about the free resource that our audience can get their hands on? Absolutely. On my website, collegeprepresults.com, I have a 14-day e-course really designed for parents on what you need to know for college admissions. And part of this comes from the fact that my own daughter is going into her senior year, but way back in probably about sixth grade, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, I had so many of my friends and neighbors coming to me saying, we're worried we're not getting the counseling at the junior high. We we want to get ahead of the game. What do we need to know and what can we start acting on now? And sign up there for that 14-day e-course every day in your email inbox. You'll either get some articles or videos or audios from me walking you through those common questions to prepare. And it could be as early as sixth grade, but it could also be you're starting this when your student's a junior And you just want to make sure you have been doing what you need to do. And if there's anything else, you could supplement it appropriately. So everyone, definitely go get your hands on that 14-day course over on Megan's website. I will have that listed in the show notes. But that is all the time we have for today's conversation. Thank you so much, Megan, for sharing all of this awesome information on the SAT and ACT. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode. If you found value in this podcast, make sure you share it with a friend and leave a review because reviews will help this podcast be discovered by other students and families that are looking to get into college. If you're interested in finding the show notes with links and free resources, go to yougotintoware.com slash podcast.